Hi, my name is Laura, and welcome to my audio version of the General Surgery Obstetrics and Gynecology EOR Study Guide. The rest of the general surgery topics can be found on my channel, but I'll link them below as well. This review is going to follow the PAEA Obstetrics and Gynecology portion of the General Surgery End of Rotation Exam Topic List, and I'll timestamp all the topics below in case you'd like to skip around. The first topic is breast cancer. This is the most common malignancy in women. One in eight women in the U.S. will get breast cancer at some point in their life. Risk factors are related to increased estrogen. So that means early menarche, late menopause, nulliparity, never having breastfed, hormone replacement therapy, and age over 65. Other risk factors include obesity, consuming three or more alcoholic drinks per week, family history of breast cancer, and genetic mutations, specifically the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Women who have BRCA mutations have a 60 to 85% lifetime chance of breast cancer, as well as a 15 to 40% lifetime chance of ovarian cancer. Most breast cancer can be divided into ductal or lobular carcinoma, depending on whether it's located in the milk ducts or the lobules. And both ductal and lobular types can be broken down into carcinoma in situ meaning that the cancer does not yet penetrate the basement membrane, or infiltrative carcinoma. Infiltrative ductal carcinoma is by far the most common type of breast cancer. It's about 70-80% to 80% of all breast cancers, and it's associated with METs to the lymphatic system, especially the axillary lymph nodes. Infiltrating lobular carcinoma makes up about 10% of all breast cancer, and it's frequently bilateral. A few more rare types to know are Paget's and inflammatory breast cancer. Paget's disease of the breast is a rare cancer associated with chronic, eczematous, itchy, scaling rash on the nipples and areola that might ooze and might have a lump present. Inflammatory breast cancer presents as a red, warm, swollen, and itchy breast, typically with nipple retraction and a characteristic skin thickening due to lymphatic blockage that resembles an orange peel. It's called pew to orange. It is very aggressive and tends to have a poor prognosis. Additionally, breast cancers can have receptors on their cells. They can be estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, or HER2 positive, and this pathology can help guide treatment. The classic clinical description of a cancerous breast mass is a painless, hard, unilateral mass. Diagnosis begins with either mammography or ultrasound, depending on age. If the patient is younger than 40 with a palpable breast mass, an ultrasound is indicated first. If the patient is older than 40 with a palpable breast mass, a mammogram is ordered first. And the reason for this is that young breast tissue tends to be very dense, making it difficult to read on a mammogram. A mammogram with microcalcifications or spiculated masses is suspicious for cancer. If imaging does not rule out malignancy, or if a diagnosis is still unclear, then a biopsy is done for definitive diagnosis. So once breast cancer has been confirmed, there are a few different treatment options. A lumpectomy allows for maximal breast conservation. However, if the tumor is large, diffuse, or the patient has had previous radiation to the breast, then a mastectomy might be more appropriate. Removal of regional lymph nodes can also be done to determine if there's metastasis. The most common sites of metastasis for breast cancer are the lymph nodes, lungs, liver, bones, and brain. So after removal of the tumor, radiation is often used to destroy any residual tumor cells. And in stage 2 through 4 breast cancer, or in inoperable cancers, chemotherapy is used. Neoadjuvant endocrine therapy is another option depending on the receptor status of the cancer. Anti-estrogen medications and aromatase inhibitors are useful in estrogen receptor positive tumors, while monoclonal antibody treatment is useful in HER2 positive cancers. Common breast cancer drugs are tamoxifen and raloxifen, which are also used for prevention in high-risk patients. Now on to screening. Mammogram screening guidelines vary, but USPSTF recommends a screening mammogram every two years from ages 50 to 75, or starting at age 40 if there are increased risk factors. A clinical breast exam should be done every three years in women aged 20 to 40, then annually starting at 40. 
and a breast self-exam should be done monthly, right after menstruation, starting at the age of 20. Not all breast masses are cancer. Benign breast disease includes fibrocystic changes and fibroadenoma. Fibrocystic disease is the most common breast disorder and typically results from an exaggerated response to hormones. It's characterized by multiple fluid-filled cysts that feel like mobile, well-demarcated lumps within the breast tissue. These cysts are often tender, bilateral, and may increase or decrease in size with the menstrual cycle. Fibrocystic disease is diagnosed with breast ultrasound, and a fine needle aspiration would produce a straw-colored fluid. It isn't harmful or dangerous, and it tends to resolve spontaneously, but NSAIDs, heat, and a supportive bra can be recommended to ease the discomfort. The second most common benign breast disorder is a fibroadenoma, especially in teens and early 20s. A fibroadenoma is a small, firm, round, painless, well-circumscribed, and freely mobile breast mass. They're composed of glandular and fibrous tissue, and the classic description is rubbery. Fibroadenomas grow gradually over time and most resorb with time as well. So if a breast mass is found, a mammogram and or ultrasound should be ordered. Remember, if they're younger than 40, they get an ultrasound first, and if they're older than 40, a diagnostic mammogram is done first. These imaging modalities can often rule out malignancy or confirm another diagnosis, like fibrocystic changes. But if imaging is unclear, then a definitive diagnosis is always made by a breast biopsy. The next topic is nipple discharge. And the most common causes in non-lactating women are ductectasia, intraductal papilloma, carcinoma, fibrocystic disease, and galactorrhea. Ductectasia is when a milk duct becomes shorter and wider, often with age. The duct can sometimes become blocked, and then fluid builds up behind the blockage, leading to the nipple discharge. And this condition is most common in women who are approaching menopause. Introductal papilloma is a small benign tumor within a milk duct. It's the most common cause of bloody nipple discharge. Fibrocystic changes are the most common cause of green-brown discharge. Now, in the case of galactorrhea, patients present with milky, bilateral, and expressible discharge. It's important to check a prolactin level in these patients because the most common cause of galactorrhea is a pituitary tumor. And the most common type of pituitary tumor is a prolactinoma, which secretes excess prolactin, causing the galactorrhea, as well as amenorrhea, headaches, and visual disturbances. A prolactinoma can be confirmed with an MRI and treated with dopamine agonists or transphenoidal resection. So we already went through breast cancer earlier, but when a patient presents with breast discharge, the important thing to rule out is carcinoma. So a breast exam, mammography, and or ultrasound should be done in all of these patients. Then, to rule out other causes, order prolactin levels and thyroid-stimulating hormone, or TSH, labs. In general, the treatment will depend on the cause, and most nipple discharge is from a benign process. But if necessary, a proximal duct excision surgery can be performed to eliminate the discharge. The next topic is skin changes, and there are a variety of skin changes related to obstetrics and gynecology. So let's go through some common ones. Melasma is a hyperpigmentation of the face that can occur in pregnant women or women taking oral contraceptive pills. It's also referred to as the mask of pregnancy. Vascular changes can also manifest on the skin during pregnancy like spider angiomas and varicosities, including varicose veins and hemorrhoids. Increased blood flow can cause a bluish discoloration of the vagina, vulva, and cervix, which is called Chadwick's sign. Stretch marks, also referred to as striae gravidarum, are common as the uterus enlarges. And pregnancy can cause changes to the hair as well, like hirsutism and androgenic alopecia. Next is adenopathy, which is an enlargement of the lymph nodes. It can be due to a variety of factors like gynecologic infections, malignancy, or inflammatory conditions. In breast conditions, adenopathy is primarily in the axillary region, but it can also occur in the internal mammary, parasternal, and supraclavicular lymph nodes. Adenopathy can indicate a variety of conditions, and these patients warrant further investigation. The last topic is pain, which we've touched on a few times in the previous topics. Painful breast conditions can include infections like mastitis or breast abscess, as well as fibrocystic changes. 
Remember, breast cancers are not typically painful. In the case of infections, treating the cause will help alleviate the pain. So antibiotics, continued nursing if indicated, and aspiration or IND of an abscess. Pain medications can also be used as well. For fibrocystic changes, breast tenderness can occur cyclically with the menstrual cycle, so supportive treatment and NSAIDs can be recommended. And that wraps up the obstetrics and gynecology portion of the General Surgery EOR Exam Study Guide. If you're listening to these videos in order, then you just finished the entire General Surgery Study Guide. If you're listening as these videos roll out, there's a whole lot of EOR content getting uploaded at once. So stay tuned, subscribe to the channel, and thank you so much for listening. Happy studying, and I'll see you in the next video.